Uh, okay, so it is uh, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, sharp, so we will start uh, with today's lecture. Uh, so welcome uh, to everybody uh, to a new week of activities here at Belgrade Sports Medicine eForum. Uh, it is a great honor that uh, for the first time with us tonight, we have a uh, Katerian surgeon, Dr. Al, uh, Dr. Khalid Al-Khalaif. Uh, Dr. Al-Khalaif is a leading uh, shoulder surgeon at Aspeter Clinic, uh, who is also a very uh, competent in the field of arthroscopic surgery of the knee, but the accent of tonight's lecture will be on shoulder pathology. Uh, it is also the great opportunity and interesting to point out the marvelous uh, medical education that Dr. Alkalaif uh, had by completing his, completing his medical education at uh, Weill Cornell Medicine College in New York, USA. And I would like to remind you that that is uh, one of the top five medical schools in USA. Afterwards, he has completed a residency program at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada followed by the two-year fellowship um, in the sports facility at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Uh, he represents a great uh, role model to all uh, young sports medicine doctors that are reaching for the first time the field of sports medicine and give us uh, one example that is possible to reach the best education out if uh, we really want to do that. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Anterior Shoulder Instability. So without uh, further ado, Dr. Alkalaif, please continue with uh, your um, presentation uh, using the share screen option. Thank you, Valjana. So I'll share my presentation now. Okay, this. yeah, we, we can see the, the slides. Yeah. Excellent. Great. So, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Khalid Khlaifi, and thank you very much for the beautiful introduction. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Aspitar Hospital and an assistant professor at Walker Medical College. Buljana, do you hear me very well? Is it good, the voice? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear a lot. A lot, a lot Excellent. Here. Yeah. So, the topic for today is anterior shoulder instability, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, me, Khalid Khlaifi, have no uh, uh, I have no actual potential conflict or, uh, of interest in relation uh, to this presentation. I will not be discussing any off-label or unapproved use of drug or pro products to this presentation. So the roadmap for uh, presentation uh, of today is uh, we'll talk today about anatomy, epidemiology, mechanism of injury, assessment of patient with anterior shoulder dislocation, whether a primary and an emergency or on the field, or in a clinic, imaging, as we know, and then finally decision or final decision of a treatment. Before I talk about anything in terms of pathology, uh, I think sometimes you need, we need to know exactly what's the definition of shoulder instability and what's the difference between instability and laxity. Maston in 1990 defined the glenohumeral laxity as the ability of humeral head to be passively translated to the glenoid fossa. This laxity is not a pathology by itself. Instability, though, uh, was defined by him as a clinical condition in which unwanted translation of the head on the glenoid compromises the function and the comfort of the shoulder. And here, pathology comes in. Shoulder, as we know, if we go to basic science and anatomy, shoulder has a wide range of motion partially due to shallow glenoid and spherical humeral head, big humeral head. This inherently unstable configuration relies on other structure to prevent instability. These structures are divided into static and dynamic shoulder instability, and both play a big role in the stability of the shoulder itself. The shoulder stabilizer statics can be bony anatomy, labrum, ligaments, and negative pressure to a lesser extent. The humerus has 130 to a 140 degree of neck shaft angle with a retroversion of 25 to 30 degrees to prevent anterior shoulder translation or dislocation, especially in external rotation. And the glenoid fossa itself has seven degree of retroversion. Even though everything is like in retroversion, still there is some part movements of antiversion due to the angle of the scabular body on the body of the patients or body of the human being on the chest. 
The glenoid itself is a pear-shaped bony structure. On average, it's measure five centimeter in the craniocaudal dimension and 2.5 centimeter in its inferior anterior to posterior dimension. The concavity measures only 2.5 millimeter deep, which is shallow. How can, how can, how can nature uh, help in that? Is by labrum itself. So the glenoid labrum itself increases the surface area of the glenoid and increase the depth of socket between 2.5 to 5 millimeter and act as a shock, shock block to the humeral head. And you can see here at the picture uh, that we, uh, uh, from the anatomy, anatomy lab in Aspitar, and you can see how the labrum increase the surface area and act as a pumper in front of the humeral uh, uh, head and prevent its translation. Main static stabilizer of the shoulder actually are the ligaments whether it's inferior glenohumeral ligaments with its anterior band and the posterior band, middle glenohumeral ligaments at 45 degrees, and superior glenohumeral ligaments, which acts as a preventing the humeral head trans anterior translation at adduction position. These are the ligaments uh, at different positions <laughs> and, and in action. As you can see here, in full abduction, the anterior band of inferior glenohumeral ligaments acts as the main stabilizer of the shoulder. This is a, a picture uh, or anatomic study done in uh, uh, recently, actually uh, this month, uh, uh, pointing the position of different ligaments on the glenoid. And you can see that usually the anterior, inferior glenohumeral ligaments or the anterior band of it is really attached to the labrum from three o'clock to five o'clock. And that's where the injury usually happen. And that's why usually we have to incorporate it on on the repair, which, which we are gonna talk about it later on. This is a lab uh, picture from uh, Aspitar uh, Hospital in our lab, and you can see the ligaments uh, position at different position. This is the capsule as, as itself. This is a subscapularis that was uh, cut, labrum there, then very glue humeral ligaments and the anterior band of it's there. Negative pressure. The negative intraarticular pressure is generated by the articular fluid within the closed system. A study done by Gibbs et al. examining eight cadaveric shoulders and applying traction before and after venting showing the role of negative pressure in shoulder instability, even though it doesn't play that big of a role. And this is in our lab showing the suction of the negative pressure on the capsule when we apply uh, a direct uh, uh, pull on, on the humerus. Shoulder stabilizers, we have the dynamic now, dynamic stabilizers, muscles around the, around the, the humeral head, such as rotator cuff, uh, which acts as a humeral head depressor and increase the contact pressure between the humeral head and the glenoid, which increase the stability of it. And periscapular muscle also are important scapular stabilizer in that they position the glenoid in an antiverted and superior position of the head. Epidemiology, shoulder dislocation is the most common joint dislocation. 1.7% annual rate in general population and more than half of shoulder dislocation happened to patients aged 15 to 29 years old three to one uh, male to female ratio, and posterior shoulder dislocation account for only two to 5% of all shoulder dislocations. The mechanism of injury is anterior force to the arm in the abducted shoulder. For posterior dislocation, usually is more traumatic, which involve also seizures and ele electrocution. Associated injuries, as we can see here, it could be bony, it could be soft tissue. Talk about first uh, bony uh, uh, lesions, such as uh, Bankart uh, lesion, which is the injury to the labrum itself, and can be up to 90% to 100%. Osseous Bankart up to 40 to 5%. Uh, uh, percent. As you can see here, usually the lesion is more of a labrum and capsule with a small avulsion of the anterior rim of the glenoid. Uh, also, we have uh, what we call traverse Bankart, but this is usually happened to the posterior shoulder dislocation, which we're not gonna talk about today. Perthes lesion, uh, this injury usually happens to younger patients who have a thick periosteum. So usually what happens in the labrum is injured and involve a periosteum to it. Alpsa, this happened more of a chronic lesion where the labrum itself attach and heal more medially and its effects is lost. And the glide lesion, that's what happened when there is some part of the articular cartilage is uh, evolved with the labrum itself. This is the direction of dislocation. And that's what usually happened. Sorry, this is the direction of dislocation, and this is what usually happen uh, to the patient. It's not post, uh, posterior to anterior, it's actually more anterior, inferior, 
uh, dislocation that involved the labrum and also involved uh, uh, stretching to the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. How do we evaluate the patients? Like any injury or any uh, medical condition, we start usually with the history. It's very important to know, to take a decision on treatment, to know the age of the patients, what kind of a sport the patient uh, is playing. Is it a voluntary? Does it happen usually even during sleep? What position? Did the patient have any, uh, did the patient reduce it by itself, by himself? Or did the patient reduce it to an emergency? Is it in a sport or recreation activities? Or if the patient have any previous shoulder surgeries? On physical exam, for acute anterior shoulder dislocation, we start with inspection, especially in the field, inspection and palpation, and also documentation of a neurovascular exam. On inspection, you'll find anterior inferior fullness, obvious in the shoulder, with a prominent coracoid anachromium, and also arm held in a slight abduction and external rotation. With palpation, patient will have generalized tenderness, and also you'll feel fullness in the anterior inferior uh, pouch of the shoulder with decreased range of motion. After reduction, patient usually will be referred to the orthopedic uh, doctor uh, after reduction for, eva for further evaluation. And we start usually uh, with the range of motion, uh, assessing the patient have any neurovascular exam or uh, any muscle weakness. Then we'll start with more uh, physical exam that is dedicated to shoulder instability, such as sulcus sign. And we can be graded to one, two, and three. And usually, patient is positioned on a sitting position and pulling on the arm to know how much laxity is the patient having. Also, anterior drawer test to see if there is of how much translation, how much we can translate the humeral head on the glenoid. Also, load and shift will play the same role. And uh, and this is this is the grading system for a humeral head translation. But the main test that everybody talks about, athletes, physiotherapists. Uh, even uh, sport physicians and the surgeon is apprehension test, apprehension and relocation and terror uh, release test. And several studies have shown that the production of pain upon laxity testing doesn't confirm the di diagnosis. The Spiritel in 1994 uh, uh, tested the, the test and compared apprehension to pain and found that only pain can account with the specificity of less than 50%. But if the patient said that I feel uncomfortable and I feel that my shoulder is going to dislocate, the specificity and uh, can increase up to 90%. General laxity is very important uh, to know um, uh, and we use usually the beta nine point scoring system to know how much is the patient is lax and if there anything like can happen to the other shoulder, does he have laxity in the other shoulder too? After finishing a, a history and physical exam, we start with x-rays. Uh, we usually do acutely AP through AP, transscapular Y view and axillary view. Usually it's very hard to do axillary view at the beginning. AP view can show you the dislocation. And, uh, but after reduction, shoulder can't be deemed relocated until we have axillary view. So nobody wants to discharge a patient who have partial uh, subluxation or dislocation. We also do other reviews to assess the bony lesions such as West point of view for assessing the humeral head and the glenoid, striker notch to, uh, to know if the patient is having big hill sacs or not, and guard the view uh, for bony bank card and to know how big it is. CT scan, of course, you don't want to send a patient for CT scan uh, who is still dislocated, unless if you couldn't relocate the shoulder to know if there is any locked dislocation. And usually CT scan can be done to assess any big bony lesions such as fractures and the humeral head fracture then the patient will need to have a CT scan. But the gold standard for, for us usually is to have an MRI, which is used to identify soft tissue injuries associated with shoulder dislocation. Um, and usually it's better to have MR arthrogram to assess also the labrum because sometimes the injury can extend up to a slab lesion uh, and can affect other parts of the body. Uh, this is the MRI that can show a soft tissue bank card. This is Hagel uh, lesion, which is a humeral, uh, uh, ligament of uh, 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 humeral avulsion of uh, glenohumeral ligaments. Also, this is the J sign of uh, Hagel lesion. Uh, of course, this is the APSA, as you can see there, with the with the line showing that there is a, a healing of the or attachment of the labrum on the middle side of the glenoid. And this is the GLAD lesion, which involves articular cartilage uh, uh, injury to the labrum. And this is the process with the periosteum extension uh, there. 
Uh, glenohumeral ligament instability can be classified in different ways. The degree of dislocation, subluxation, or micro instability that can happen sometimes when the patient has just pain whenever he's, uh, he or she is uh, throwing, especially in a posterior shoulder injury or posterior lateral injury. Direction, unidirectional or multidirectional instability, or bilat uh, unilateral or bilateral. Frequency, whether it's acute, recurrent, or locked, and usually locked, you find it in a more uh, uh, severe traumatic injuries uh, or like older patients who have locked uh, dislocation that never uh, been assessed uh, by, by doctors or etiology whether there is a traumatic a traumatic or acquired this is the pathway for acute shoulder dislocation that we're going to talk or we are talking about which is traumatic for younger patients uh, patients once the patient uh, in the field or like an emergency Usually, can, uh, diagnosis of anterior shoulder dislocation can be done uh, if it's in the field. You don't need the x-rays to know it, and usually should be dealt with it immediately there. Uh, the way to do that is whether you can do it by a, a, a reduction with retraction and counter-retraction or by milk uh, uh, procedure, uh, even in emergency. Stem uh, I did it once, uh, really to tell you the truth, when I was a resident, and uh, it was fun to have it, but it takes some time because the patient needs to be relaxed to have the shoulder uh, reduce and takes time. Uh, this can happen when you are like really busy in emergency room. Uh, immobilization after relocation. Uh, there was a, a lot of, um, uh, in one time, there was a lot of uh, discussion about uh, type of uh, immobilization after relocation. Do you immobilize the patient on external rotation with abduction pillow or internal rotation? What's the best position for the healing of the labrum? Uh, on the glenoid. And actually, this is a study that was done in 2015. A meta-analysis of randomized control trial showed there was actually no difference. And the recurrence is the same whether you do it in external rotation or internal rotation. Rehabilitation and recurrence, redislocation rate can range from 45% to 100%. Usually, the number that we talk when we teach our residents is 95% depending on many factors, of course. A decision of surgery for the first time dislocators is still controversial. And uh, usually in exams, they say like in a first time dislocator, you can treat it uh, uh, with, uh, with no surgery. Uh, but recent studies actually, and this is one of the recent studies that published, I think on uh, April this year or May, and this is uh, done by Eric J. Strauss, which is a systemic review uh, and meta-analysis for arthroscopic pancreatic repair versus conservative treatment or conservative management for the first time traumatic anterior shoulder instability. Uh, the conclusion for the study is that arthroscopic pancreatic repair resulted in sevenfold lower recurrence rate and the higher rate of return to play compared to conservative management. Thus, the arthroscopic pancreatic repair may be advisable for the, to be performed for first time dislocators, especially for athletes. The decision of surgery and instability depends on many factors. Sometimes you will have the player coming in with the team physicians and physiotherapists saying that there is a bony lesion, patient needs a letter J. Now, this is not the only thing. There are many things that should be taken into consideration. Presence of bony lesion, other soft tissue injuries, failure of a previous surgery, chronic or acute setting. How big is the bony lesion? Is it bipolar, unipolar? Many factors it plays on the decision or on the final decisions. Option for surgery, as we know, there is a soft tissue procedure for soft tissue pancreatic injury, arthroscopic pancreatic repair. This is the one that's uh, mostly done everywhere in the world. There is also open pancreatic surgery that uh, people used to do it before. Now we're going more into arthroscopic pancreatic repair. For bony injury, we have open letter J uh, procedure, arthroscopic letter J procedure that is coming. Uh, Reemplissage if there is a big bony hill sac humeral head augmentation with their allograft or with the arthroplasty. For arthroscopic pancreatic repair can be done on a lateral position or B chair. I prefer to do it in a lateral position. Uh, it's a preferred over open technique because it's allowed detailed diagnosis of other pathology, if there's any other lateral tear. Less post-op pain and lower morbidity, smaller incision, improved consmesis, and no disruption of subscapularis where you, in open technique, you need to cut the subscapularis so the rehabilitation will take longer and the complication, of course, is higher. This is how we do it uh, uh, arthroscopically. As you can see there, the labrum uh, is injured. This is where we take the labrum and we, we tie knots uh, for it. Usually, the least number of knots is the three from 530, uh, from five, uh, 530 position to three o'clock uh, position. Uh, this is how we do it. Uh, 
at least me in Asbitar now, what I'm doing it is by uh, uh, arthroscopically and after elevation of the labrum, identifying the labrum, I try to do it with only two poke holes, not three or four, and I use the knotless technique, so it's faster and takes around the 35 to 45 minutes. Uh, so of course, what happens if there is a bony lesion there? If there is a bony lesion and small, less than 15%, usually what I do is uh, the bridge technique uh, or uh, pancart, uh, triple B, pancart uh, repair uh, bridge technique, uh, where we involve that piece of bone and try uh, 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 to attach it to the glenoid by anchors. Result of arthroscopic pancart repair, redislocation rate is similar to open surgery. Recurrent inst of instability is around 7%. So there is still recurrence of instability for some patients. And 90% of patients return to pre-injury level of activity. We'll talk about the return uh, rate with the recent studies. Uh, the post-op rehab, uh, phase one, zero to five weeks. I like to keep the patient zero to five weeks in sling. Some studies say four, some studies say six. I prefer to choose in the middle. Phase two is uh, five to 12 weeks active and passive range of motion achievement. And phase three can take up to six months for strength training uh, activities. So what are the risk factors for failure? Uh, uh, so this is by Buelo uh, study uh, where, where he came up with an ISIS score, which is funny that it's called ISIS, which is instability score. Uh, an instability score can be used to identify patients and categorize them, whether they can go for back heart surgery, soft tissue, arthroscopic, or by open procedure with bony augmentation. And it depends on many factors, whether there is a bony injury at the hill sac or a glenoid, there is any shoulder hyperlaxity, and any type, what type of a sport and uh, what degree of a sport participation, whether competitive or not, and age of the patient above 20 or less than 20. Any score of above six patients will need uh, bony uh, surgery because they will have a 70% failure of arthroscopic surgery. So we have to keep that in mind when we assess the patient. That's why history is very important. We need to know what type of surgery, what's the age of the patient, what kind of hyperlaxity he had when we, when we measure it on the other shoulder, on other joints, and what type of, uh, of sports, whether it's contact or non-contact. When do we start to think about different procedures other than arthroscopic pancreas repair? So, number one, when we have significant glenoid defect, significant, which I'll talk about percentage, significant health sex injury, failure of a prior arthroscopic procedure, if failed ones, you don't need to do it the same, you have to do it in a different way. When there is an ISIS score of more than six, seven and above. As we know, a lot of studies done to measure what is the significant glenoid defect. And uh, a lot of study, uh, uh, one of the studies, uh, a lot of studies done on cadaveric shows that loss of a 20% of anterior glenoid rim has been shown to significantly reduce the force required of anterior glenohumeral translation and increase the chance for uh, of free dislocation. Uh, so the, the, the right number is actually uh, above uh, 20, uh, let's say above 15%. That's when we come in and decide and, or think about other procedure than just bank art repair. So how do we measure a glenoid bone loss? We have different way, we can do it arthroscopically, but when you do it arthroscopically, it's late already. So you can do it by CT scan, uh, knowing how big, uh, how big is the lesion or how big is the piece comparing to the whole glenoid. So you have the uh, uh, different techniques you can apply for it, which is best fit circle, glenoid index, or PICO methods, or ratio methods. This is the, the arthroscopic technique. This is how you do the bare spot or uh, uh, technique uh, when you do it on or, or the best circle when you, come, when you measure it and you can measure how much percentage is this piece comparing to the whole area by this form, for, formula. It's not hard, but it takes a little bit more depth and you have to take time for your patients to do that and choose the best surgery for the patient. After deciding on pony procedure, uh, you can do the letter J. This is how we do the letter J by uh, cutting uh, part of the uh, 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 acromion and uh, 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 or like you take a part of uh, uh, take a part of uh, sorry uh, take a part of uh, of the bone and attach it to the glenoid itself. Uh, after that, uh, uh, or the uh, coracoid. Uh, sorry, for taking part of the coracoid. After that, you can uh, after fixation. Uh, the effects uh, of letter J itself 
uh, can increase the surface area of the glenoid. Number two, you can perform also uh, capsular uh, repair or tightening. And number three, the main factor that can increase the stability of the shoulder after letter J surgery is the sling effects of the conjoint tendon, as you can see here. So this one acts as a sling that to prevent the humeral head translation and abduction and external rotation. Type of bony glenoid procedure letter J. So we have also uh, types of letter J. We call it, uh, or like let's say bony procedure. Classical, congruent arch. Classical usually done in modern Europe. Congruent arc is done more in US. And also we have the Presto, which is the, the, the older version of uh, letter J, which is the came, came up first. Uh, uh, came, up, came up first before letter J. So um, uh, Ethwal et al. did a, a very excellent uh, study in London, Ontario, um, uh, and he compared the Presto versus letter J, and uh, the finding was that the letter J procedure results in a more stable shoulder and cadaveric study. This is a study done on May, uh, in uh, uh, last May, uh, in a journal of arthroscopy by Rossi et al. Uh, in 2020, and they compared uh, uh, both uh, the congruent arc and the classical uh, letter J, and they found actually uh, uh, they have the same return to sport rate, the same recurrence rate, the same healing rate, and the same complication rate. So you can do uh, the both different types. The post-op protocol, some people say like uh, for phase one, they like to keep it for three weeks. I like to keep it for four weeks. Bone healing is excellent, but we need to give it some time. On phase two, uh, range of motion can start from four to 10 weeks and phase three, strengthening 10 to 15 weeks, depending. And then on, on, uh, on the type of sport, patient can go back to its sports. Complication of letter J, there are several studies shows that letter J complication rate can be up to 25%. So that's why we try to keep it a little bit later on. The main, uh, sorry, the complication are infection, hematoma, shoulder pain with 2% incidence of screw removal. And studies show that after screw removal, the pain decreased. Osteoarthritis, recurrence, neurovascular injury, and range of motion limitation. Other bony injuries and management, such as HELSAC, uh, we're going to talk about now, osseous defect, which is an osseous defect at the humeral head, present in 40 to 90% of all first time dislocators and nearly 100% in recurrent dislocators. And, and usually it's uh, uh, the presence of it at the posterior superior lateral position. Can be defined whether it's engaging or non-engaging and on a tract or off a tract. And these things should be measured to know how big it is and to know whether it's affect the stability of the shoulder. Uh, health sec, uh, uh, can be assessed by, uh, by x-rays, but the best thing is to do it by, by uh, paper came up by Kudal et al by CT scan. Uh, so you can measure how much percentage uh, of it. And uh, usually the, uh, uh, the significant per uh, percentage of health sack injury is when the, the size of it is uh, around 25 or 20% uh, of a humeral head. That's when you have to interfere. So uh, several types of surgery can be done for uh, this injury, such as a disimpaction, that can, uh, can be done uh, acutely if the patient came up, uh, came up with a locked dislocation and patient need to go to emergency immediately and reduce, you can do disimpaction, uh, especially if it's less than 40% uh, percent of the humeral head. Reemblissage can be done uh, for defects from 20 to 25% with bank art uh, repair. Also humeral head bone augmentation for defects more than 25%, uh, usually with an allograft, whether a humeral head allograft or femoral head allograft and uh, humeral head resurfacing partial or complete for a defect that is more than 40%. And usually these defects can come up with, a, with a motor uh, vehicle accidents uh, or big injuries. It's more of a fracture than just a dislocation or a hemiarthroplasty for older patients with uh, low demand. For aspital experience, uh, usually we are guided by the population. We see most, uh, most, of, most of our patients can be divided into like athletes and general population. We have soccer players. So they have very low shoulder dislocation rate and the general population with many present after several dislocations. Uh, in terms of surgical stabilization, our experience, we perform a high percentage of letter J procedures for our general population. And our technique, uh, I use the congruent arc uh, technique. Uh, and I use now actually more of a classical technique, but uh, more with the one, only one screws. 
as you can see here, those are both uh, my cases. And our primary finding when we compare one screw to two screws, usually it has same results, same bone healing rate. Uh, we think that one screw has more bone contact, faster surgery, lower risk of a fracture, uh, especially of the uh, uh, coracoid and uh, with, the same, uh, with the same results, uh, finally. Uh, finally, uh, uh, return to sports, as we know here, this is a systematic uh, review that done by uh, 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 Zinning Lee, or what we call, uh, call him uh, Tiger Lee, uh, who had uh, uh, a study in 2008 comparing all, uh, sport, uh, all uh, return to sport after surgical treatment of anterior shoulder instability and found that 97% of, of athletes or uh, general population 97% uh, uh, after uh, patients return to sport after arthroscopic care repair, 83 to 85% return back uh, to sport after letter J. Uh, the time to return to sport after bank, uh, uh, the average is six months for letter J is uh, uh, five months. Uh, so the take home message uh, for today, anterior shoulder instability is common. On field management and reduction is a must before patient going, even before taking x-rays. Athletes who are first-time dislocators are more likely to have further instability. So our advice for now is to do surgery. Decision of surgery depends on patient factor, kind of a sport, and the presence of other bony lesion. So it's not just if, if, if MRI shows small uh, crack of a small crack of bone, doesn't mean the patient needs an open letter J immediately, and also depends on the patient's uh, contact sports, whether the patient is a rugby player or American football player. Return to sport is excellent if it's treated early. Thank you very much. I wanna thank you really for inviting me uh, to this uh, webinar. And uh, I invite you all to the World Cup and uh, hopefully in 2020. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for uh, this great uh, lecture. I think it was interesting to, to people. So, uh, we can now open the uh, online discussion. So for all participants that are new here from this week, uh, we have two ways of um, asking questions to our lecture. So you can uh, use raise hand option when you click on participants in the bottom of uh, the uh, screen, you will get the window and in the bottom of that window you have a raise hand option. When you click on it, I will get a notification that you want to ask a question. Uh, the other way is to uh, write the question down in the chat section and I will uh, read it here so you can get your answer. Uh, okay, so we have uh, the first uh, thing that is uh, in the air. So Dr. Bani Krivokapic, orthopedic surgeon here from Belgrade. Bani, you can uh, ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Khalid. Uh, hello. Hello, I'm coming from Serbia. I used to be a fellow <coughs> orthopedic surgeon in Aspeta three years ago. Unfortunately, we didn't have um, time to meet each other, but hopefully in future we will. And yes, of course. Dr. Popovich told me so many nice things about you, and I really hope that we meet each other thank soon. You. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was great. Uh, and uh, even I'm, I'm not doing shoulder surgery, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I was uh, listening to some, uh, some uh, pre presentations about anterior dislocation. And my question to you would be, uh, what do you think about some surgeons' decisions, shoulder surgeon decisions recently, uh, to do only remplissage, even if they have anterior dislocation, without uh, a soft tissue bunk card? Because they think that with remplissage, the rehabilitation is uh, much faster, and that even uh, closing the, the, the anterior labrum, uh, actually, the anterior labrum after the injury is so weak and uh, the, the tissue is so bad that it's uh, almost impossible to reinsert on the right place and to heal. So some of them are just thinking about doing only remplissage. That would be my first question. What do you think about it? And the other thing is, uh, do you think in impact sports that you mentioned like rugby or American football, whatever, uh, that uh, Latarje is the must-have procedure. Thank you very much. 
So that's excellent, excellent question. So for the first question of anterior shoulder stability, and we've been doing a bank heart repair for a long time, you know the recurrence rate is around 95%. Yes. If anterior shoulder, and just I'm thinking, I'm, I'm asking you just to think with me about it, about this thing. If after surgery, the recurrence rate is 7%, so we reduce it from 95, 90% to 7%. That means this surgery is working without doing a, a, a reemblissage. Now, reemblissage, you have to do it if you have a, a little bit large pancart, uh, sorry, if, if you have a, 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 a large uh, health sack uh, injury, uh, uh, especially like around the 25%, especially if it's, on it, uh, if it's off a track, and especially if it's uh, engaging, especially at the function of abduction uh, of 90 degrees, as Burkhardt said, and the range of motion of zero to 135 degrees of uh, external rotation. Uh, for these reasons, you have to do, if I, if I am going to do a patient and doing arthroscopic repair, pancart repair should be, involved, should be done and should be involved. Uh, for uh, reemplissage, yes, I will do it. And usually what I do is that for the surgery is that I put the anchors for it. I don't tie it, I do the pancart, then I go do the reimplissage, I tie it at the... Uh, the problem with reimplissage really, uh, which I don't like, is that the patient will have pain, shoulder pain, posterior shoulder pain, and the patient will complain a lot about it. And some patients actually will have a decreased range of motion, especially in external rotation. Uh, yeah. So those patients usually like complain about it. So, and if you think about it, uh, Shoulder dislocation, especially first-time dislocators, they will have health sack, but it's very small. So for those patients, I'm I'm not gonna wait until they have a bigger health sack, then I'll do reemplissage for them. I will do repair of the pancart, and it's gonna decrease the rate of uh, shoulder dislocation. So for me, no pancart is uh, is obvious. You can see it in MRI. It's a pathology. Uh, yes, there is a recurrence rate of five to seven percent, but it's better than ninety-five percent or ninety percent. For younger patients. Now, the second question is for rugby player. Uh, and I, I treated rugby players with shoulder arthroscopy, especially if they don't have any bony lesion. Why is that? Usually those patients come in like if they are young. So you don't want to do uh, for a young patient immediately a large procedure. What if this procedure failed after? What's your options? It can fail. Oh. You know? So after failure, I mean, then you can say, okay, I'll go to letter J for you guys. But like, uh, for from the beginning, if they don't have really like indication or ISIS score that is not that high, you know, mm -hmm. I try to do a bank heart repair, uh, mm -hmm. especially for those patients because remember, letter J have also uh, uh, complications such as osteoarthritis. So you don't want those patients to end up at 30 years old with osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. No, no problem, man, no problem. But I agree with you. Usually if, if I find any, just as like a piece of bone and let's say 10%, I will go for letter J. And usually it's a discussion between you and the patient. Does the patient want to really continue on? The, does the patient really want to continue on like to be like a, sports, a yeah. competitive, yeah, competitive uh, athlete or just to, to, to be involved in university and then stop? So it's all about discussion. It's not like uh, a computer decision, you know? Oh, yeah. It's more, yeah. of a, more of a talking with the patient. Individual. Thank you very okay. much. And hopefully we'll see you soon in Doha. Yeah, yeah, hope, hopefully. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Vanna, for the question. We also have a hand raised by Flavio Cruz, who also posed the question in chat. So if Flavio can uh, join us with microphone, he can ask a question uh, in person. Flavio, you can turn on your microphone if you are in possibility to do that. Okay, welcome. Hello, hi Khaled, congratulations hi. for the presentation. Thank you. So just one, uh, seems to be a simple question, but it's important to people understand, especially uh, physiotherapists. Uh, when do you request uh, the exam for check the bone healing in lateral G procedure? Do you think it's really important to have this uh, assessment or what do you, how do you manage the healing bone in the lateral G procedure? So usually if the patient is not complaining of any stability, uh, doesn't complain of uh, uh, severe pain, no need for imaging post-op. The studies shows that even if there is no healing between bone uh, of, of the uh, coracoid and the bone of, uh, of the glenoid, uh, if, if there is no healing, it's not a problem at all. Uh, still the results are excellent. 
So usually, as long as the patient didn't have any disl further dislocation, no need for imaging. I would do CT scan only if the patient uh, complained of a problem or if I want to make a study comparing different kind of techniques. But CT scan imaging, even after a pancreas repair, MRI imaging, it's not going to uh, change anything. It should be the same thing, uh, unless if the patient have any problem or dislocation. Uh, they found that uh, if there is any fib uh, uh, fibrous union, even if there is no he real healing, just fibrous union is enough for lateral jail procedure. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Flavio, for uh, your question. Uh, there is a hand raised by Milan Tomovic and also was by Professor Nebusha Popovic. So, uh, Professor, do you want to ask a question or later? later? Ladies first. Ladies first. Okay, okay, thank you. So, Milena first. Milena, you can ask your question. Turn on the microphone. Okay, thank you, Professor, for this. Hello, Vilja. Hello to everyone. Hello, Dr. Khalid. Nice Hi. to see you again. Uh, my question concerns recurrent shoulder instability after the initial surgery. What is, your, in your opinion, the best solution in this kind of cases? Is it a re a revision surgery or maybe some rehabilitation procedures? And what is the most important factor that will guide your decision in this kind of situations? So after, uh, uh, so we have to think whether the patient have a dislocation at the early stage. Uh, how did the patient have dislocation? Is it a new traumatic injury or not? Of course, you have to, to repeat the whole non the imaging to, to assess the bone. For me and for many surgeons actually, uh, uh, another dislocation, you have to go now to the next level, which is the bony procedure, letter J. Uh, because you don't want to do another pancreas repair and the patient will have another dislocation because it's failed already. Uh, the failure usually is not because of the surgery, it's not because of the surgery, it could be because of the biology itself, or it could be because of another traumatic event. But usually once the patient has that, that means the patient is a prone for more dislocation, even after uh, capsular, capsular, ca capsular and labral repair. So for me, usually is another, uh, it's, it's further surgery, which is uh, uh, letter J surgery. Now, sometimes, we have is that the failure of, um, uh, I had one case really like a patient who had a letter J, uh, so, I mean, it's not my, my case. Uh, so the patient came in with a letter J, was done excellent uh, by another surgeon and came in with a shoulder dislocation. After reduction, patient didn't have any problem because the sling effect is still there. Even though when you do CT scan, you feel like that bone displaced and the screw displaced, but the patient didn't complain of any problem. So you can measure it depending on the patient, depending on the sport, but usually after pancreas repair, if the patient came in, with another dislocation, patient will need a letter J procedure. Okay, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Milena, for a question. Uh, so, Professor Popovic, uh, you wanted to, to ask something. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent lecture, Khalid. <clears throat> I would uh, only share uh, with you uh, that you told us uh, that uh, decision to do the latter J, especially in, for the first uh, dislocation in young person is not easy decision. Why? Uh, people have to know, because if there is a failure of latter J, there is no big things after to do. Yes, and uh, right. Right. and I, uh, I would like uh, to impose uh, your approach uh, that you said uh, this individualized surgery or surgery a la carte for the, for the athletes. And uh, normally that you, <clears throat> for the pelvic location, uh, usually you have to start uh, with the bankart uh, arthroscopic surgery. And uh, in that case, 96% uh, of the people are going to be fine and still if it is not fine you have a latter J as a second option but uh, uh, I was uh, also seeing uh, most of people uh, surgery are devising someone are doing only latter J or someone are doing only bunker and that's bad and I uh, support uh, your approach that you have to 
uh, individualize uh, your surgery depending on, on the, the age. And the, uh, I don't have the question. Thank you very much to be in, uh, part of uh, Belgrade uh, Sports Medicine in, in form and uh, we see each other in Shala. It's, it's an honor, Dr. Bovic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for, for sharing your thought with us. So uh, one more hand is raised by Professor Sasha Buben from the University of Nish, that is faculty for physical education and sport. Uh, Professor Buben, you can ask your question to uh, our lecture. Dear uh, Dr. al Kelaifi, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. And uh, also many thanks to Professor Mazic, to Professor Popovic, and to Prof Professor Juric for enabling us to participate to this lecture in an interactive way. Now I will uh, say something like an uh, ex-handball player. In the slap lesions that are common in handball players and uh, in accidents, the first test used by biomechanicians is the speed test. That is the same test made for bitus brachit and vinopathy. Then uh, we are using O'Brien's test and crank, uh, crank's test with internal and external rotation of the shoulder, like in handball shooting. And uh, my question is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, not so much related to your uh, lecture, but uh, for me, it's very significant. Uh, to what extent the shoulder mobility is compromised by the previous loss of lordotic neck, neck curvature? Or to what extent the forward head position compromise innervation and blood supply causing a rotator cuff injury? Are you familiar with that uh, problem? No, no, In actually. Uh, no, no, uh, I'm really not uh, familiar with that, actually. No. You are not? No, no. Okay, thank no, you sorry, very much. I mean, I mean, I'm very sorry about that, but like uh, maybe I didn't understand your question. You mean like uh, the lordotic of the neck and to the blood uh, supply yes. to the rotator cuff? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the loss of a lordotic curve okay. uh, in the ne neck region, to what extent it is, uh, it is uh, uh, compromising uh, uh, blood supply and innervation causing the rotator cuff uh, injury? Uh, that is the maybe something uh, related to prevention of uh, some uh, shoulder injuries, mm -hmm. occurrence of shoulder pain. Maybe you are familiar with that in the hospital. No, no, actually, if you can send me some papers about that, it would, I mean, I will be more interested to learn about this, actually. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no. I'm, sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't help you with that uh, question. I'm very sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you, Professor Bowman, for your question. We have one uh, in chat, so from uh, Nedal Al Katib. Uh, hi, in the case of failed La Trage, what is the option? So, uh, now the options are a little bit uh, difficult. So, once we patients have a failure of uh, La Trage, of course, you have to go now back and remove the whole thing, remove the screw, uh, the piece of bone. Uh, then we have to have to think about an allograft. And for allograft, you have uh, two options usually. Whether if you have, uh, uh, you have, oh, sorry, for bone, uh, for other bone, you have two options, two options, autograft or allograft. Autograft, of course, you can take it from uh, uh, iliac crest, and many people do that. But the problem is uh, a pain after with the patient that can have uh, and at the, at the iliac crest area. The other option that many people from uh, uh, Rush University and uh, uh, in Chicago that they do is that they take a distal tibial uh, uh, allograft in which they take a part of the distal tibia. Since the curvature of the distal uh, tibia uh, or uh, uh, the curvature of the distal tibia and the cartilage surface can mimic a little bit the curvature of the glenoid itself. And by that, by having that piece, you can fix it with the two screw. So the main goal of this surgery is to increase the surface area of the glenoid. You will lose the, the, uh, uh, the effects of the sling effects of the conjoint tendons, unless if you try to fix it to that, uh, uh, to, uh, to that uh, piece of, uh, to the piece of the allograft and also tightening of the capsule again. 
uh, the results of it is not excellent, of course. Uh, uh, patients still can, might have uh, osteoarthritis since the piece of itself is an allograft, so you might have some kind of resorption of that bone, unfortunately, even after fixation and healing. Uh, but still, many patients, uh, uh, still, uh, it's, it's the last option for uh, patients with uh, failed letter J procedure. Uh, okay, thank you for, for that answer. So for now, there is uh, no more questions in chat. Uh, okay, somebody else wants to raise hand and ask a question. We'll give people a few moments more to come up with questions. Okay, still in chat, nothing. Okay, okay, no. Uh, so, uh, one moment or two, maybe, if somebody has a problem with connection. No, nothing in chat. Uh, Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions from, coming from uh, audience, can you please uh, allow me to ask one more uh, as the moderator of uh, this uh, small please. event? Uh, so uh, it is uh, well known, it is really um, tricky and hard to treat the uh, multidirectional instability in shoulder uh, using the surgical approach. Uh, so what is your think about using the laser assisting head capsule shrinkage in this multidirectional shoulder instability? Have you performed it? Have you some experience or generally what is your opinion in using this procedure? Now, uh, I don't know about the laser, like, uh, do you mean like by surgery itself or uh, by arthroscopy? Because what we had before is that you can do it by arthroscopically where you can uh, shrinkage the capsule itself to, uh, uh, to have, uh, to treat patient with multidirectional instability. To tell you the truth, it's not, uh, the outcome of it is not excellent. Multidirectional instability treatment is physiotherapy, physiotherapy, and physiotherapy. Now, we don't want to go back to surgery and try to do capsule, uh, like uh, uh, try to make uh, some kind of uh, shrinkage of the capsule or uh, tightening of the capsule. Patient at the end will have some kind of complication. It's not an easy answer for patients, you know, especially for the patient who have voluntary uh, uh, dislocation, voluntary uh, subluxation. It's fair. The treatment of it usually is, is uh, rehabilitation, rehabilitation, rehabilitation. Always rehabilitation. Push the patient to rehabilitation and try to push them away from surgery. Okay, uh, so thank you for, for your answer. I'm currently studying for my board exam and I uh, run to this uh, information during the reading. So I just want to, to uh, pop the question. Good luck, good luck. Uh, thank you. So uh, one more chance for our uh, audience. So uh, anybody wants to, to ask a question to Khalid? They are shy maybe okay. uh, so uh well because there is no more question coming from audience i would like to uh say a huge thank you to you for uh, finding time to join us here and provide this great lecture for our audience so a uh, huge thank you on behalf of the board of belgrade sports medicine forum and on myself as the moderator of uh, this event it was a great opportunity to meet you and to learn today from you uh, and also I would like to announce for our art audience the uh, next week lecture that is going to be the final of the uh, summer season here in Belgrade Sports Medicine Forum. So it is uh, the uh, lecture that will be given by Dr. Maria Carmen Adamus, uh, the cardiologist from Aspetar, uh, that, that has a great experience as a sports medicine, but also a clinical cardiologist. And the subject will be cardiovascular consideration for the return to play after COVID-19. Uh, starting from Monday, I will start sending you invitations to all participants to join this lecture as well as we all do previous, during previous week. So, Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully see you soon in Pilegrad and or see you soon here in Aspetar in the future after we finish from COVID-19. So please uh, stay safe and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, bye to everybody.